Welcome to the Paperless Productivity Podcast, where we have experts give you the insights, know-how, and resources to help you transform your workplace from paper to digital while making your work life better at the same time. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Kevin Kolkowski. I'm with ImageSoft, and I will be your host for today's podcast. It is estimated that approximately 57% of the global population, or roughly 4 billion people around the world, are outside of the shelter of the law due to a variety of cost-related and logistical hurdles. And this barrier to justice was intact well before the pandemic forced courts to operate in a more remote, virtual, and thus limited capacity. The costs of transportation, missing work for court dates, child care, and the emotional toll of confusing court processes had long driven a wedge between justice and the people who needed it. Time-sensitive cases such as family court and divorce, civil disputes, landlord-tenant cases need to be processed even during a pandemic. As the world continues down an increasingly virtual path in all aspects of life, online dispute resolution, or ODR for short, is gaining momentum to provide a virtual dispute resolution platform for private businesses, government entities, and courts specifically. Today's episode is the first of a three-part series where we will talk about how online dispute resolution is one of those technologies helping to create access to justice in the US, Canada, and really around the world. We'll discuss how the technology elevates the barriers to justice through a robust, secure, affordable, and extremely manageable alternative to in-person litigation. We'll talk about a fantastic real-world example where the founder of the Collaborative Lawyers of Saskatchewan uses ODR in his 40 plus year family practice to provide a reliable, convenient, and fair service for his clients. And we'll discuss the National Center for State Courts ODR vision for 2021 and beyond. In today's episode, we're gonna discuss our partnership with Resolve Disputes Online, a provider of ODR technology based out of Australia. We'll explore how on- online dispute resolution technology came about and how it's used globally in various industries with deployments in the US, Canada, Australia, the UK, Thailand, and more recently in Africa. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's guest, Joe Alkayat, co-founder of Resolve Disputes Online. Thanks for joining us today, Joe. Great to be here, Kevin. How are you doing? I am fantastic. I'm I'm excited to be joining you. Um, Excited to really get this conversation started. Sure thing. Sounds great. Well, let's Let's get right into it. ImageSoft has recently partnered with Resolve Disputes Online to provide ODR technology to the U.S. and Canadian markets. Can you tell me a little about both your background as well as your company, Resolve Disputes Online? Yeah, well, like a lot of the team behind Resolve Disputes Online, we are basically a group of recovering lawyers. And we also practice as mediators and in the field of alternative dispute resolution. And quite simply, during our years in practice in, in in the various jurisdictions that we worked, whether it was the UK or Australia or places like Singapore, we, we realized that for the majority of the world, there was a common problem where, where the cost of getting a, a civil dispute resolved was very expensive, uh, very time consuming, and it didn't really matter what the value of the case was. Even a case of relatively modest value was still very time consuming and pretty expensive. So the whole sort of momentum of RDO started way way back when, you know, when we were lawyers in practice. And certainly we just thought we could potentially create something that could improve access to justice in those jurisdictions. And we initially started out creating a tool that was a lot more basic than what it is today. But we had an awful lot of interest in it. And, you know, I guess the the technology then started to get a bit of a life of of its own. Yeah, I love that term, recovering lawyers. That uh, <laughs> makes perfect sense. It, it gives you a unique perspective. You've been sort of on that side of the coin, you know, working with the litigants and working with your clients and, and trying to get access to justice. But, you know, you, you've seen it from that perspective, and that's that's fantastic. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the points that probably comes from that is you not only see it from the litigants uh, the litigants point of view and you see the sort of the emotional turmoil and obviously the financial costs that that it that it puts through them but you also get a sense of being a stakeholder of a court or a tribunal service and you know what it's like 
to to interact with with, with that that entity and, and and you can see the the inefficiencies perhaps not you know notwithstanding that many of the folks who would work in in governments around the world are all doing their their best it's just you know some of these systems are very very old now some of the processes and, and the bureaucracy therefore that follows is very considerable so i think having the backgrounds that, that we had really helped us in understanding what it can be like as a user of, of some of these some of these court and, and tribunal services yeah i think the courts nowadays are especially here amidst the pandemic are really making every effort to streamline some of those processes and make things easier in this sort of new normal we're living in these days so that's yeah that's fantastic mm -hmm. yes absolutely yeah so Online dispute resolution, it is sort of a, another direction I want to go here. It was originally developed in the private sector. And yeah. it's now taking off in the court system. And, and we at ImageSoft have customers in both the private sector and in the, in the judicial system, as well as a number of other you know, branches of the government. And they could really all benefit from an ODR platform. How did this technology come about? And you sort of alluded to some of that before in your previous answer. Um, but how has it adapted over the years to serve different markets and different use cases? Yeah, it's it, it's very much been a, a, an organic piece. I mean, uh, if, if ever you speak to a to a, a technologist who says that they they build their you know that that they build their first version and then nothing really happens to the, the technology at that stage, you know that that wouldn't be true. It's constantly oh, an iterative oh, process. Yeah. Right. It's uh, it's very much an organic process, and you know we had our technology in the first instance serving i mean one 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 of the advantages of the jurisdictions we practiced is you know the english speaking world with with the common law jurisdictions you know there's a lot of similarity not not only that alternative dispute resolution specifically mediation is very much a global product so uh, a lot of the a lot of the workflows that that might be appropriate in say the uk or australia in a mediation is also going to be very comparable probably to the us and that's indeed how 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 that transpired and also in places like canada yes there are some nuances but a, a mediation workflow tends to follow that, that that classic route but but there is obviously a challenge when you're looking then to look at different use cases and I think what we've been very successful in doing is working with great partners in with different use cases, whether it's been within the court systems, uh, whether it's been in different types of cases, whether it's landlord and tenant, or whether it's family and, and divorce, uh, as you alluded to in your introduction, whether it's things like traffic, as long as you've got the expertise within, within the organization that can just tweak facets of the technology, that that's really ha how we've done it we've just relied on great experts who have been able to supplement our, our own knowledge to just tweak certain uh, aspects of the technology in terms of how, how that workflow uh, works so that's really been been the journey kevin yeah that makes perfect sense you you've got experts in certain markets and then of course you know the customers themselves and adapting it to their process and making it fit within their existing technology you know, you put all that together and, and having a very flexible tool, you know, you're able to adjust that tool to work within that particular use case and within that environment. That makes, that makes sense. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. And I mean, I, I'd imagine given the, the breadth of customers that, that ImageSoft has, I, I imagine you would have had firsthand experience of that, you know, being able to, to tweak different aspects of technology and workflows to make sure that that really hits the spot for the customer. Yeah, this, that's really our inception as a company. I mean, that's what we've been really uh, our entire 20 some years as a company. And, and now we're, we're tackling a different market with online dispute resolution. And this is, that's just another tool in that, in that, in that space for us to work with. For sure. Yeah, sp um, speaking specifically about the court system, because, you know, we, again, we talked about the private sector a little bit, but really this is more court focused. How has the RDO platform helped to increase access to justice? That's really a major initiative for jurisdictions these days. Can you share a little bit about your experiences and, and maybe some success stories? And maybe even some, some things where you've, you've struggled. Yeah, for, for sure. There is a, I mean, the, the use cases and deployments with governments relate to the court annexed alternative dispute resolution 
systems that, that they might have. So it might be that there's an encouragement once a claim is filed to spend a period of time getting involved in, in a, an, an ADR process, whether that's negotiation, mediation, or, or, or something else. And really the, the, the big success has been that a number of those cases that would continue to go through the court systems would have been siphoned off at that point and then would never have come back into the court system because the parties would have found a, a resolution. And we're, we're really starting to see a real growth area where courts are, are seeing, uh, seeing ADR as a way to, for, for want of a better phrase, you know, bust the uh, backlog. And many jurisdictions are, are facing that challenge. And I think that the, the challenges that we've had in terms of doing that is some government or some courts don't necessarily have, they, they either don't have rules that uh, court rules or, or pre-action protocols that actually manage alternative dispute resolution processes. So they might not have anything that gives any level of, of requirement for parties to negotiate or mediate a case. It becomes a voluntary process. And because of a lack of knowledge of those processes, some litigants just don't don't even go there. Um, so that that's been a challenge. So perhaps for, for for some partners, case volumes maybe haven't been quite as significant as they as they would have liked. But but the alternative is that there would have been a very heavily prescribed ADR process, which has been for for want for, for want of a better phrase, you know, it's been hard drafted into various facets of court rules or, or legislation, and therefore to facilitate the use of a technology, some courts have had to go and get court rules changed. Now, prior to COVID, that was a bit of a challenge. You'd find that many governments, many courts had great difficulty in terms of changing court rules quickly. But it seems to me that since COVID in particular, I think given the urgency of things that we, we've now found that that's less of a challenge. We're finding that a lot of partners when they're going through their change management process can actually change some of their court rules a lot quicker to enable the use of this type of technology. Yeah, we've, we've seen that too. It seems to have uh, speeded things up a little bit when, when necessary. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And, you know, the, the two points that sort of spring to mind are, you know, necessity is, is the, the mother of invention. And, yeah. you know, we've been in online dispute resolution for a long time. And it, it's really since the pandemic that, the, that there has been a huge amount of urgency to try and to try and get this technology in because of the pain points that, that are being experienced now because of the pandemic. But then secondary to, to that is going to be the uh, backlogs of the course are starting to, to increase. And I think there was there, there, there's a, a gentleman who you may you may well in due course speak to the the, the NCIS, but I think he, he's been working in ODR technology for lot longer than I have. And I think his his words were that, that COVID has done more for online dispute resolution in, in, in 2020 than, than what had been achieved in the past, you know, 10 years. And and there's two reasons for that, right? One is obviously the, the necessity piece. But I think also it's it's meant that courts and governments are using technology, which has maybe made them may, maybe brought those barriers down in terms of then scaling to a more advanced piece of technology. So if you start using video conferencing, perhaps the next step might be that you start using a platform like, like RDO that has a specialist yeah. online dispute resolution workflow, because, and that doesn't seem as intimidating to get past your, your change management procedures because you're already starting to use technology because you had to, because literally the, the doors of the courts were, were closed. So yeah. that, that's been very fascinating watching that develop. Yeah, sort of incrementally advancing your technology tools available to you. Um, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Makes sense, yeah. So tell me a little bit about sort of the worldwide footprint. Your ODR solution is currently deployed in the US, Canada, the UK, Thailand, and Singapore. That's that's my understanding. Can you tell me about the beginnings of RDO and how it's taken off to penetrate some of these various different markets and, and solve different types of, of scenarios? I think that you, when when you know when one creates a piece of technology like this, you perhaps hope that you you can have these very very uh, simple ways to to expand your technology. So you'd start off in one country and then you'd move to another country and so on and so forth. 
the way that expansion has happened has basically been, I, I suppose, that folks within governments and in the private sector who feel that, that they want to make a difference in their jurisdictions and want to and they want to implement technology uh, again it's just happened in, in a very organic way did did we ever think that we would be you know be operating in seven or eight different countries i guess we we didn't i think we thought that we would maybe focus on one or two areas first one or two jurisdictions first and then and then maybe scale the the technology out but it, it, it's just happened in a very organic way. And I suppose in every technology, in every country, in every government, you have your, your people who are going to be the, the early adopters, you know, the ones that are going to be wanting to, to, to push boundaries. And I suppose we've just had to make sure that we've catered for, for some of those partners, the ones that were, were looking at this uh, a long time ago, you know, not since, uh, not, not just since COVID. And you know, there's always there's always a really interesting theme that that you see when you speak to customers and or or, or partners. And you know, I think somebody summarised it well to me. He calls various people in technology or customers prayers, players, and stayers. So the stayers are the ones that are sort of hoping that change doesn't really make any difference to their careers, and they can happily retire, and they don't need to get used to to technology. Then, then you've got your, your, your players who are the ones who are the, the early adopters. And I think, you know, and there's obviously different spectrums in, in between there. And I think we had those initial early adopters, the, those players, and that's why expansion for RDO was, was so easy. Now I think we, we have some of the old prayers, but they're now praying to get rid of their backlogs, which is why they're so interested in, uh, in new technology. So again, it's that, that um, element of necessity that's compelled people to maybe get out of their comfort zone and start looking at this type of technology. Yeah, it's great to get when, when you get those, as you described them, players on board, they help you not only advance the use of the product by, you know, becoming customers and, and, and you know, bringing that technology into their environments, but they also feed you ideas, which help, you know, things you haven't thought of maybe they feed you ideas, then you implement it in your product. And then that, if that appeals to some other customer down the road, it helps you advance it even further. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And you know, you know, it's it's always one of those one of those approaches that that we take whenever we speak to a new customer. Although we've been in this space for a long time, we 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 don't assume that that that, that we we know it all because that's when we stop growing as an organisation. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to go into every conversation that we have with a partner, whether it's a a US state court whether it's a government in, in Asia, whether it's a, a large corporate in, in Australia, we, we go in there with our, with our eyes wide open uh, and we're, we're also listening and we're also thinking what, what nuance or piece of the technology could these guys bring? So we, we see every, every potential conversation that we're having with partners in, in different parts of the world as a real opportunity to grow ourselves as a, as a product. Yeah, innovation is a collaborative effort. Nobody knows it all, and it helps to get a lot of minds together, for sure. Exactly right. Yeah. And I guess staying in the same realm of innovation, and, and maybe this is part of innovation, is security. It's an increasingly crucial and therefore scrutinized aspect of all information systems these days, and I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on it. Can you speak to the security of the platform and how it goes about protecting both the the details and the communication surrounding a case, particularly one that might be sensitive in nature? Yeah, it's a, it's a key consideration, Kevin, and you know, any, any government, you know, one, one of the things that you really don't want to be happening is getting any breach of data. The thing is about, about a dispute is by their very nature, they're extremely sensitive matters and the consequences of any data being leaked on a, on a case is obviously very, very serious. So even from when, when we started, given our backgrounds, we were able to be pretty, pretty cognizant of that point. And we, we have technology layers within the RDO platform, which includes things like end-to-end -end encryption. We have obviously the ISO accreditations for security and, and quality. And when one's looking at, at encryption, you know, you, you break it down further, you start looking at 
is 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 the encryption happening in transit or or, or is it all the encryption happening at rest so without getting too uh, too technical <laughs> there's for, for the for the benefit of some members of the of the audience who maybe don't know huge amounts about encryption but some data when it's sitting within a platform unless it's moving is not not encrypted and therefore it's important that even when data isn't moving that, that it remains encrypted within the platform. So sensitive things like files, case information, messages, video communications, all those things remain remain encrypted as 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 the data moves. So that's been something which uh, we've made sure that we've 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 captured at the very heart of the technology. And the the hosting partners that, that we work with, including obviously the the folks at, at ImageSoft. All the hosting partners we work with are the, are the best names and they're, they're people that we're happy can protect the brand of RDO and, and obviously protect the security of the users on our on our platform. Yeah, it, it's security. It's one of those things that it's constantly evolving. You constantly, you know, the, the product obviously was designed with that in mind, but it's something you have to constantly stay on top of and evolve with that aspect of the market. to. to continue to outpace those who would who would look to get into a system they shouldn't be in yeah yeah that that's exactly right and you know it, it's it's all always moving and and always shifting and you know you one needs to keep keep their finger on the pulse when it when it comes to security i mean that there's lots of examples you know you see very large companies that who who are i won't mention on this on this call but i mean there there are lots of large companies with very large security teams who who have suffered both during the the pandemic and and obviously prior to, to the pandemic, where huge amounts of data has been been uh, been compromised, and that's very unfortunate. But you you know we we want to ensure that RDO and an RDO partner is is not going to be in in the headlines for that for that reason. And I think I think what one of the other facets just to touch on is I think some technology that's being used for, for some sensitive matters doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily uh, built with, with those uses in mind. I mean, some of the video technology, it's sort of con consumer video technology, some of it's it. Awesome. And yeah, yeah, you know, it's not necessarily going to be technology that's, that's purpose built for sensitive legal matters. And I think that's probably one of the advantages of some of the RDO tech stack is, you know, it is built purely for, and it's only got the use case in, in disputes, but other products, you know, perhaps don't. And, and therefore there can be some, some challenges there for those, for those products. Yeah, that, that makes, yeah, it makes perfect sense. It, you know, you, you'll build up with that in mind. Yeah. And, and I guess in terms of sort of the, the industry as a whole and, and what's on the horizon for RDO and, and I don't know, maybe you don't want to give it away too many secrets, but any new initiatives, new markets, features that customers are clamoring for that you're you know looking to bring to market soon? Anything you'd like to, to add there before we wrap it up? Yeah, I think you know that there's there's a lot of interesting stuff on on the horizon. Without without giving away any any sort of state secrets, it we're we're always looking at, at new areas of technology and seeing how that might might apply to, to RDO. I mean, just to give you a quick example, we're, we're always at the cutting edge of research and development. Four years ago, when, or five years ago now, when blockchain was starting to become a little bit more mainstream, you know, we, we were simulating smart contract settlements of a, of a mediation case. And there was indeed uh, some partners in, in Asia that, that found that very fascinating and we as far as we're aware it's actually a, a world first for for anyone to have done a, a mediation settlement using uh, smart contract technology so that 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 sort of stuff is very much in our in our, our dna and i think the next part of the horizon is going to be looking at how artificial intelligence can can help parties resolve cases without necessarily needing a, a human being and uh, I think I think that potentially has huge amounts of consequences, uh, both good and bad. But by bad, I simply mean um, that it will require some careful thought, and that there'll need to be an, an ethical uh, approach, obviously, to how one is managing this type of technology and what that roadmap looks like. But given our, our background and given our knowledge, we're, we're pretty confident that we can strike the right balance there. 
And I imagine, Kevin, that at that juncture, uh, it may well be that you and I can have a, another deeper discussion on the role of AI in, in online dispute resolution, which is truly fascinating. That is, that's exciting. That's exciting stuff. AI is making its way into a lot of markets and a lot of different use cases these days. And to bring it to this market, that's, that's great stuff. And I think you have to do that. You have to continue to evolve a platform to stay ahead of the competition, to, to bring new value, to, to stay relevant and stay at the top of the market. So that, that's fantastic to hear. For sure. Yeah, it, it's, it's been great having Joe on today's podcast. I, I feel like we could keep going, but I'm, I'm being told we're kind of running out of time here. So Joe, thank you so much for giving us a breakdown of Resolve Disputes Online and the, really the innovative technology helping to improve dispute resolution today's very different COVID world and in, in providing access to justice for people around the world. If you share our mission, if you want to bring efficient dispute resolution to the private sector or to improve access to justice in, in your court system and want to learn more about the opportunities an online dispute resolution can bring to your practice, we would encourage you to visit our ODR-specific website, www.resolvedisputes.com. That's all one word, resol resolvedisputes.com for an expanded walkthrough and or to request a demo. So with that, Joe, thank you so much for your time. We will be back with the next part soon. Thanks for having me, Kevin. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Have a good one. To learn more about ImageSoft, please visit imagesoftinc.com. That's imagesoftinc.com. If you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to Paperless Productivity, where we tackle some of the biggest paper-based pain points facing organizations today. We'll see you next time.